Okay. Right. <laughs> no, right? Yeah, it's fun. So it's kind of late, and I actually haven't gone through this talk timing it, but I think I can go through it fairly quickly. And if you guys have a burning question at any time, we can discuss it. But uh, a lot of it is kind of a summary of things that we discussed already, and it does have a little bit of retrospective on, on what I have done through the years. This is uh, what is what kind of mag ambitiously right now called Cottonwood Creek Apiary, so it's not a lot of colonies. And this is where I have my colleagues right now, near Creston, Colorado. Um, this was in the spring. Uh, they have grown quite a bit. This year was better than last year. And in terms of sustainability, I could summarize it in different ways in terms of what I brought in and where I'm at. But in simplest terms, in this little group of colonies that are now six, I've only had mortality due to stupidity. <laughs> Moving colonies from Louisiana to the San Luis Valley in November before they had had a chance to turn over into winter bees. Some came light on honey. So that year I lost two colonies to starvation. I had to do triage to combine colonies, so that was my stupidity. And then I have had a few queen losses through just beekeeper manipulation, but no mortality from mites, because I measure mites, and there has been definitely a growth of the colonies. So that's just kind of a little attempt at making things sustainable, and I I am running queens that I have a good idea that they have a good level of resistance to mites. This is kind of a cool genealogy picture, sort of just related to genetics. These are my great great grandparents. This is a picture taken probably in the 1860s in a region of Colombia that is called Antioquia and the famous city of Medellin. If, if we go back on the history of this part of the family, these guys were aristocrats, kind of elites, businessmen, and that's kind of my lineage on my dad's side. Um, I think the business part of the genetics sort of fizzled out on my dad's level. <laughs> but that, that's one lineage. And this is my son kind of messing around with the other side of the lineage, which was, this was my great grandfather who was an MD in neurosurgery from the US. And this picture was probably taken in the 40s. Uh, so I'm kind of bicultural and binational. My dad was Colombian, my mom was from the States, and this gave me the opportunity to be sort of in different places at different times related to honeybees. Uh, this is a picture way back in 86, and you can tell who I am. Uh, and we're in the eastern plains of Venezuela. This gadget over here is a folded up drum trap which is kind of a big cone shaped device that was put with a queen lure on a high pole and we were studying the mating biology of Africanized honeybees and the guy in the middle with the camera you might recognize his name Eugene Killian from the Killian family that used to do a lot of comb honey production they wrote a few books and at the time he was the bee inspector for Illinois and a group of bee inspectors came down to Venezuela where we were working to kind of look at Africanized honeybees which is one period of my research experience. Mm -hmm. So because of a lot of circumstances not because I sought it out or because I was really active at it 
I came across a, a number of topics that were kind of hot at the time and gave me a good perspective of where beer genetics plays a central role. Africanized bees, this, this is an apiary in Venezuela, uh, work with tracheal mites and work with varroa mites. So just one way of looking at these systems that I have worked on is from where do the genes come to make the scientific comparisons. In terms of Africanized bees, there are obviously two very widely diverging populations in many behavioral traits, defense, and so on and so forth. And the challenge when we were working in tropical Latin America, it was very easy to get Africanized bees, but very hard to get European bees. We typically imported European bees from the States to do any kind of comparisons. Or sometimes we found like relic populations of European bees in some isolated areas, like in the highlands of Colombia, I was able to sometimes find like old Spanish bees and I used those for some of my experiments there. In terms of resistance to tracheal mites, if you have read some of the literature, they were typically, or they came from importations from Europe, Yugoslavian bees, Buckfast bees, and there was a really neat selection program that people in Ontario did for resistance to tracheal mites where they took a base population and they, they did bi-directional selection and produced bees that were good at dealing with tracheal mites and not so good. In terms of resistance to varroa mite, uh, I have been sort of involved in collaborative work. I wasn't the primary person, but it was on selection on populations that were already in the United States. And as I mentioned, it's being done in Europe right now. Uh, so that's kind of an idea of where you can get different genes or different systems. This is just one example of work that I did on Africanized bees. Uh, on this right is a, a number of figures that look at mortality of colonies through time over a period of 18 weeks uh, that were kept in different experiments in the high Andes of Venezuela at about 14,000 feet, which was simulating winter. So we created these packages or nukes and moved them up to those elevations. We had measured everything, number, weight of bees, weight of comb, weight of honey. And we also looked at mortality. And the dark line is Africanized bees, and the dashed lines are Europeans or hybrids. Uh, looking back at this experiment, it shows how rapidly, under some circumstances, uh, European colonies can, I mean, Africanized colonies essentially don't make it through these conditions. And we work collaboratively on a bunch of other traits, defensive behavior, foraging, pollination, mating biology, and demonstrated that between those two stocks, things differ. Uh, as I said, overwintering was kind of my big set of experiments. So on, on C, that Africanized line, yeah. they stayed the same. Yeah. Stayed the same. So. That was that was on it. That was one treatment or one set of experiments where we started the units with brood. So I think what that did was it gave them a, a, a clutch of bees that were that took the colonies into a survival mode that was more realistic or more more real or more <coughs> useful for Africanized bees to stay alive when they had to go through a situation of no flight or cold and they couldn't forage, that, that's where you saw the catastrophic lines of, of decline. If we look back, let's see. So this experiment was the first year. It was very cold. There was no forage. Okay? A big drop in Africanized bees. 
this experiment, these experiments were the second year, which were was somewhat warmer, and there was actually some forage. These colonies were closed and not allowed to fly. These colonies had brood at the beginning of the experiment. These colonies were broodless at the beginning of the experiment. So there's slight differences, but I think what overall it suggests is that in conditions where there's no forage and an Africanized bees cannot bring in protein to replenish their worker population, they crash pretty fast. So it's not a matter of whether they can thermoregulate because the temperatures were fairly low at those elevations at night, particularly. Yeah? So on Thursday night, I was sharing how like a lack of protein can produce winter bees. Do you think genetically, like Africanized bees don't have that trait that turns on their ability to produce more phytogenin? Yeah, right. I, I think, and these were very field-oriented experiments in the 80s. I wish I had concentrated a little bit more on the physiology because I probably could have determined that much clearer, but I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a certain switch there that seems to be lacking in Africanized bees. The switch from, from not nursing to turning into winter bees and all those corresponding physiological yeah. changes in the diligent and fat bodies and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Okay? Tracheal mites. Uh, we worked with field experiments that showed very clearly like that Yugoslavian buckfast bees were highly resistant to tracheal mites, whereas resident US bees that were likely of Italian origin were very susceptible. Um, so that was kind of an interesting part of it, but then Bob Danka and I got into the, the idea of trying to figure out why they were resistant. And after a lot of attempts at looking at all kinds of possible mechanisms, we did crazy things like uh, shave off the the hairs at the entrance to the thoracic spiracles with little pieces of, of uh, broken up shaving blades. Uh, we, we, we looked at the morphology of the spiracles at the entrance. Uh, we looked with chemists at the cut cuticular hydrocarbons that were in resistant bees and susceptible bees during the early part of their lives, which is when tracheal mites move into, into their spirit. And none of that panned out. And then we found an old paper from the 60s where somebody had cut the mid-legs off workers and found that they got more infested with tracheal mites. So we worked on that system and found that resistant bees use their mid-legs. You can see this mid-leg kind of way propped over the thorax to brush off the migrating tracheal mites. And we decided to be a little bit more humane and rather than cut mid-legs, we glued them with super glue and to impair that grooming ability. And overall what that showed is that resistant bees are much better at using their mid-legs to brush off the tracheal mite females when they're in that migratory phase from an infested worker that's old to a young worker to start the cycle all over again. So that was pretty cool and it's a totally genetically determined behavioral mechanism that confers an economically useful trait to, to colonies. And we talked a little bit about BSH, which is, which is another <coughs> Uh, project that I have been involved in. This is a, a graphic illustration put together by Jeff Harris, but very quickly, BSH, or Varroa Sensitive Hygiene, is based on workers removing cells infested with reproductive mice. So on the left here, we have a pupa with, with a mother mite and progeny mites, right? 
here it's partly removed and the mites are still here and this is sort of the final fate of what you find after active VSH activity. This cell with a pupa and a single mite with no reproductives in it just remains like that and generally VSHVs will leave this infertile mite infested pupa alone and selectively remove these. So again, it's a genetically based behavior that uh, involves seeking, finding, and removing fertile mites. And it's genetically based, and from field evaluations, it produces this effect of the total mite population drop. How do you think in the fruit. People have tried to work on it and it's still unclear. Uh, the big uh, what lack of clarity is whether it's something produced by the mites or something produced by the injury that the mites do on the pupa or a possible combination that involves a signal something that the that the her pupa gives off. Mm -hmm. So it, but it's very hard to separate the factors because they're all packed into a little cell. So experimentally, how do you create a situation where just an injured pupa is giving off a signal, or just mites are giving a signal? So it, it's been hard to figure out. Yeah. Did, has anybody noticed whether there is more movement of the pupa? when they're mite infested or less or different uh, Yeah, nobody has has worked on that that I know of, but it's sort of a, an open question. And it's, it's mostly interesting kind of scientifically, but in terms of, of what the mechanism is, it's, it's not so important from a practical standpoint. We just know that it happens. So I was, for example, telling Craig, one way of measuring whether you have a colony with high VSH, and it's not for everybody to do, but it's still fairly straightforward, is take an infested comb from another colony in which you can measure the level of infestation with Varroa in a row of cells. So for example, you go through 100 cells, you open all of them, and let's say it's infested at 20%. You put it into a VSH colony where all the workers have some VSH, and then after seven days, three days, depending on how you want to put it together, you remove that comb and reassess the infestation. Typically, in a good VSH colony, the infestation decreases by 90% or so. So it means that they target the, targeted about uh, nine tenths of all the cells that were infested and removed them, which is pretty dramatic that they can do that. Um, that is genetically based. So, just so that we stay honest uh, and we don't think we understand everything, for those three systems, there are some kind of perplexing anomalies that don't match what we understand or that don't don't match what we expected. For Africanized bees, the distribution and impact that we thought would be sort of along a, a line that was climatically based uh, worked pretty well in the southwest. But once you get to the southeast, it sort of didn't happen. In other words, we thought that based on climate, all of the southern tier of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida would have a high impact of Africanized bees. And that has not happened. There have been detections, but not, not kind of a clear invasion and, and impact. In terms of tracheomites, uh, 
there were obviously a problem that was frequent and dense, problematic through the 80s and 90s. I mean, if you look at the bee journals, it was kind of a hot topic at that time. But something changed in the mid 2000s, and they stopped being so problematic, and they're harder to find and harder to find at a at a at a high rate. Uh, and this is a question we talked about for varroa mites. If selected stocks, kind of at the at the level of research apiaries, work as well as on reliable treatment. Why, why have they not spread like wildfire into the commercial sideliner and hobby meeting? So, always something to surprise you, something that doesn't match expectations. Uh, also, to keep me honest, these were two projects that I personally directed kind of at the tail end of my stint with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Sur Service, and that were total failures at finding genetically based resistance. You've heard about Nosema serrani, the microsporidium. I struggled and never found any clear evidence of a phenotypic uh, effect on infection through time, and if we even pick colonies that look like they were low versus high, propagated them to the next generation, that effect dissipated. So there was no evidence of a genetic basis to possible resistance. In terms of another Varroa trait, which I guess we could call SMR, which is suppressed mite reproduction, and was kind of the first term that was used for VSH, before they understood the real mechanism. Uh, I tried to select for varroa, for colonies in which varroa reproduced in brood and or did not reproduce. And I, at first it looked like I had something in the first few generations, but then through time it just didn't hold up. So two big frustrations on projects that had a lot of merit, but really nothing came out of it. So based on my experiences and looking at what kind of traits seem to be selectable and robust, uh, mechanisms of resistance based on behavior are much more reliable and universal. Whereas things that tweak on physiology and other mechanisms may be more difficult to select. Um, the other thing is, clearly for tracheal mites and for varroa mites, we have mechanisms that can be of economic use uh, for tracheal mite resistance and varroa mites. So, when it comes to looking at what can be done, and we already talked a little bit about this, here's some general guidelines. For Varroa, you could start top loading with existing proven genetic material from trustworthy sources. And we talked a little bit about what is trustworthy and what's possible. In some form or another, you should have the ability to control matings because the dilution from a first generation, a second generation, can be pretty destructive of whatever you have that is useful. Uh, as much as possible, use measurements that are precise. So for example, a lot of people might be selecting based on whether colonies survive or not, or how long a colony survives. That's kind of an indirect measurement of varroa resistance. If you can get closer to the mechanism or to the to what confers resistance to bees, you can probably make much faster progress. Uh, and in, in talking with John about things and kind of thinking about re this region, I would propose that for areas which with short seasons, a two-year cycle of evaluation and propagation 
is more doable than sort of a typical one season cycle. And this is just a work in progress where I'm sketching out possibilities. So we're, this basically takes you through a season of winter, spring, summer, and fall. And you can kind of get into this round robin at different points. So for example, you can establish spring nukes or you can establish fall nukes and then take them through, through a cycle that maybe not in the first year but in the second year you can have more information so that after a period of summer growth and evaluation you can make a decision on whether you have colonies that are worth propagating or colonies that should be called or at least the genetics of that colony should be called so that the colonies that you propagate you get queens and then you can use the biomass of the cult colonies, the workers to establish fall nukes that go into your first winter or second winter and then you do spring evaluation a summer growth and evaluation and you can kind of keep things going but it, I think it ties well with John's idea that you can keep smaller units that are nukes packed together so that they stay well through the winter and uh, you don't have to have full colonies going through a winter and you can have more units at the same time to evaluate. So, as I said, this is a work in progress People can probably contribute ideas about how to do this, but I think it's, it's sort of a, a working model of things that can be done here. Uh, and that, I think, is the end of the, the presentation. Somebody gave me this a long time ago, but it's kind of pertinent. <laughs> and it can go, go both ways, you know? It could probably say, Jose, the bees go on the outside. <laughs> it's a collaboration where we're learning from each other's experience and also making sure the other person doesn't make a mistake. So, Do you mind changing that to Bill? <laughs> <laughs> this was totally I a random thing. I Somebody had given me this like many I years understand. ago and I thought it would be a good random moment at the end of the conversation. <laughs> So I think that's the end of what I wanted to show as a PowerPoint, and I don't know whether you guys have any questions or we're done, it's kind of late, and we're still talking bees. So just a question, do you guys think this, this graph back here as a model makes some sense? A lot of, a lot of the evaluations further south are like one year, but I think our season is so short that taking things through a two-year two cycle is much more realistic for evaluation and, both for, and also for propagation. So, yeah? Well, I've been really interested in just like the propagation cycle and how we would get our own you know, just better genetics in our own bee yards. How many hives do you think would be necessary to kind of get this cycle going? You know? Good question. Like, oh. Yeah. If, if you talk to some of the big authorities on bees, they'll say, oh my god, you, you, need, you need big populations of, and they'll say dozens, maybe hundreds of colonies. And if, if you look, for example, at the model that Dr. Rinder created for the Russian bee program, it's extremely elaborate. So that is kind of a theoretical, what? A theoretical model of what would be ideal, but in practice it just doesn't happen. And I think that has been one of the issues that has made the Russian bee program and association kind of they linger and they still produce something, but they're just not following those protocols because they're too complicated. So I think something that is simpler, more realistic, is still possible. And I, I was telling Craig, this 
this concept that we have to fight inbreeding by having a large population is true if this were truly a close population. But in the U.S. we have all this genetics that we can just bring in new queens if something is not working right and kind of replenish the, the gene pool. So I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm starting with six colonies. I think yeah. when I get to 24 or so, I can probably pick crosses that I can make and go with that. <coughs> and remember, you're you're not just crossing queens, you're crossing a, a number of drones in yeah. the fraternity. Yeah. How long are you planning on doing this study in this town? Mm, until my back gives out. <laughs> what I'm getting at is, do you think that two years isn't enough? That it maybe should go to five years? What, on this cycle? Right. No, I, for Varroa, a colony after it turns over, it already has the right genetic, <coughs> the right genetics of workers. And in fact, John Harbo and some of the early experiments would do these tests where he made a, a giant package of bees, subdivided it into mini packages, and then established colonies with test queens in them. The cycle from the beginning of that experiment to the end was, was only 60 days. So in, in <coughs> two months, you can get resolution on whether it might grow or, or, or go down. So, so that can be pretty immediate. What I worry about in, in our short season is that if you start with very low levels of mice, let's say in the spring, and only go through one cycle, by the summer, end of summer stuff may not have resolved so you need to go to the next cycle okay that's why i was wondering but i don't think you need to go three or four if anything your queens are not going to be there after two years plus or the likely part. Right. okay we're good I just want to say thank you to all of you for being what? So welcoming. I was very nervous at the beginning because I didn't know what to expect. This was kind of a new format. And I think kind of from the audience participation that we got, it went fairly well. So, and I guess it's a little bit messy because we, we don't have like a nice little clear list of topics to discuss and we can't go through a checklist and say A, B, C, D. But I think we covered a number of interesting ideas and keep dialoguing among yourselves. One thing that may be too idealistic, but uh, is one way of approaching this is you could work cooperatively between a few highly motivated people and pool your resources in terms of colonies, time, evaluation. It's in human nature that breaks down pretty quickly, but uh, I think if, if you have the passion, you could possibly make it work too. Thank you.